Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Chris, and I want to talk to you about metaprogramming today. Uh, so we're going to look at some Scala macros using Scala Reflect, and then Scala Meta, and then at the end we'll talk about Shapeless. Um, I work for Ovo Energy in London. We're a green energy supplier. Uh, we use Scala Meta and Shapeless and all, all sorts of fun stuff. So if you can write Scala and you want to work in London, then let's talk. So today I'm going to talk about meta programming, but before we do that, let's just talk about normal programming. So the kind of programs that we write day to day, they look like this. You have a program or a function of some kind which takes some input data, produces some output data, and it may also produce some side effects along the way. So meta programming is quite a scary word, but it's basically the same thing. The only difference is that your data, your input and output, are representations of programs or parts of programs. So you take some representation of a piece of program, like some Scala, and you do some transformation or some computation, and you produce another piece of program. So one way to do this metaprogramming in Scala is to use Scala macros, or they're sometimes called Scala reflect macros. Um, and a Scala macro is just a, a normal Scala function that happens to run at compile time. So when you compile your code, this macro will run and it may transform some part of your code into another, something else. Uh, the input and output of a macro are trees or abstract syntax trees, uh, and they look a bit like this. So uh, this piece of Scala code on the left, this foo.bar, is represented internally by the Scala compiler as an abstract syntax tree that looks like this. So it's got apply at the root, which means it's an, a function application. We're applying a function. And then on the left-hand side, it has the, the function that we're actually calling, foo.bar. And the right-hand side is the list of arguments, which is just the empty list in this case. So let's write a macro. We're going to start really simple, and we're going to write a macro that doesn't do anything. It just takes its input and returns it unchanged. But along the way, we're going to print out the tree, just so we can see what they look like. Is that big enough? Can everyone see OK? Yes. OK. Um, so here's just an example of using the macro that we're going to write. So we have echo. That's the name of the macro that we're going to implement. And then this block of code here, this curly braces, um, this whole block of arbitrary Scala code is the one argument that we're going to pass into our macro. So our macro's input will be an abstract syntax tree that represents these four lines of code. Uh, so before we implement it, I'll just show you the build file so you can see what, kind of, what the infrastructure looks like to, to set the stuff up. Uh, I'm using Scala 2.12, but you can use macros with 2.10 and 2.11 as well. And I just have one uh, dependency on Scala Reflect. So we have two functions here. Uh, the first one, called echo, is the one that we called in our example. Uh, I can just show you the example again. So down here, we're calling echo, which is this function here. And we're passing in one argument, which is the block of code. Uh, and what this echo thing does, it uses this special macro keyword, and then it delegates to echo impl. So there's another function down here which does the actual macro implementation. So this echo impl, it gets passed as its arguments. First of all, this context. Now the context is the kind of entry point into the Scala reflection API. So this is where you get everything that you need in order to write macros. So you get that as your first argument, and then your second argument is a tree. So it's a, a representation of Scala code. And then finally, oops, sorry, the return type here is another tree. So we have to return a tree. 
Uh, we import the universe, which means just import everything in the, the namespace. That's the easiest way to import stuff. Um, so I said we're going to return the same argument that we were given unchanged, so that's easy. We'll just return it. But before we do that, let's uh, print it out as well. So if we now compile our example, which is in source test Scala, then we will see that the macro will run and it will print out the tree. There we go. So it's printed out the whole tree for those four lines. So as you can see, these trees get pretty huge pretty quickly. Um, but if you look at the content of the tree, it's, it's not really that complicated to understand. I mean, it's a block of code in curly braces, so it's, it's represented as this block type here. And then it's just got a list of statements inside the block. The first one is a val definition, so it's saying val x equals one, and so on. So these trees are not impossible to understand and work with, but it's not really that user-friendly. So luckily, we don't often have to work with these trees directly. We have um, another feature of the Reflection API called quasi-quotes, and these are a much nicer way of dealing with trees. So let's level up, write a more interesting macro, and in the process, we'll learn about these quasi-quotes and see what they do. So again, I'll show you an example usage first. So here, I want you to imagine that we are writing a kind of database access library where users will be able to write database queries using normal Scala code, using a kind of DSL, and then we will convert that into SQL statements and execute them against a database. So we've got this query method here, this query function, which will be our macro. Uh, it's typed to the user. We have this case class user, which has a name and an age. And as an argument, it takes uh, a kind of filter predicate so that you can uh, select based on this filter. So the user can build this up using plain old, SQ, uh, plain old Scala here, and then we will turn that into SQL. So when we print it out, it'll look something like select star from user where name equals Chris, something like that. Okay, so to implement that, uh, I've done a little bit of the, the groundwork here. So I've created this query trait, which will represent a, a database query, a select. And we'll need to provide in our macro a, the name of the table and the filter that we want to use, which is a key value pair. Uh, and then down here we have the, the same pattern as before. We have query, which uses the macro keyword and then delegates to the implementation. And then down here we have the implementation itself. Uh, I've already taken care of the table name, just basing that off the name of the type, which was user in our case. So if I just open up the example again. So in the example, we had code that looks, looks like this, underscore dot name equals Chris as a string. So we want to match, pattern match on this so that we can extract that field name and the value and generate a filter from it. Um, and that's what we can do with these quasi-quotes. So this Q thing here, this means quasi-quote. This is a special kind of string interpolation. So if we just write it as underscore dot and then some field name, 
and then double equals, and then some value, which is a string. Then we can both pattern match and extract the data that we're interested in at the same time. So now that we've got the field name and the value, we want to create an instance of this query trait up here. So we need to provide the table name and the filter. So again, we're gonna use quasi quotes, but this time we're not pattern matching, we are producing a new tree also using quasi quotes. So we write new query, and you basically write it as, as if you were writing Scala code. But you can, you can splice in these uh, fields that you've extracted. So val table name, which is a string, is, that's just the table name that I've already calculated based on the type that we were given. And val filter is, um, so it's the field name, Oops, sorry. but we just need to turn it into a string. And then, so that's the key and the value is just the value that we extracted before. So we've, so we've used quasi quotes to match, pattern match and extract some data and we've also used quasi quotes to produce some new data. So we're returning a new tree here. So then if we run our example, it should print out some SQL. There you go. So this is a very simplistic example. Obviously this is not a real database access library, but hopefully this gives you a taste of how you could write some quite powerful DSLs using macros. Um, and you can see that everything is nice and type safe. This argument that we, have, that we passed to the macro here, this bit, this is type checked by the compiler before the macro sees it. So if I make a typo in here, if I wrote Namai instead of name. Common mistake, I think. And we try and compile this. Then it, it doesn't compile. So you have nice type safe, typo safe database access. Okay, so we've seen a couple of examples of Scala macros. They're quite useful I hope, and quite help, interesting, hopefully. But, unfortunately, we shouldn't use them. <laughs> Stop using macros because they're going away. I'm not kidding, is what Adrian Moores said at Scala Exchange. Um, which is bad news, I guess, but the good news is that there is a replacement for them, and the replacement is Scala Meta. So, Scala Meta is made by the same people, approximately, who made the original Scala macros API, most uh, primarily Eugene Bermarco. Um, and it's a complete rewrite from scratch based on a lot of lessons that they learnt from, um, from creating and maintaining the original Scala Macros API. So it's just, it's similar, it's got a similar API, it's just nicer, it's better in a lot of ways. And it's also, it's completely separate from the Scala compiler internals. So it's a lot easier to port to things like Dotty and IntelliJ, and it's just easier to work on the code base because it's not intertwined with Scala. Um, it's made up of a syntactic API and a semantic API. The syntactic API um, is all about parsing source code, Scala source code, and understanding the syntax of it, what it, what it looks like, what is valid syntax. Um, you can tokenize it. It handles things like white space and comments correctly, so it's good for things like IDEs and uh, source code formatters and that kind of tooling. Uh, it also has an implement implementation of quasi quotes. Um, and it's available now. It's ready and I'm using it in production. It works. Um, the semantic API, on the other hand, is that's all to do with what the entities in your program. Like if you have some val x in your program, what does that refer to? What is this x? And if you had an x here, 
and an X over here, elsewhere in the tree, do they refer to the same thing in your program? So it's about the meaning or the semantics rather than just the syntax. Um, this is obviously more complex and it's a work in progress, but the very first piece of it has just been released a couple of days ago, so you can try it out for yourself. It's in Scala Meta 1.6. Um, Scala Meta is quite a wide-ranging meta programming toolkit. It's not just about macros. It's useful for a lot of things like tooling and IDs and, and things like that. But the part that we're interested in today is macros. So we're going to focus on one part of Scala Meta, which is called Meta Paradise. And this is the way to write macros using Scala Meta. So Meta Paradise is a compiler plugin and it introduces two new keywords into Scala called inline and meta. Inline is pretty simple. It's very similar to the existing inline annotation. It just says, like, take the body of this method and copy it to all of its call sites. Uh, whereas meta is a way of um, demarcating code that runs at compile time, so macro code. Anything that's inside a meta block is code that runs at compile time and deals with trees rather than like runtime values. Um, so that was probably not a very good explanation of what inline and meta mean, so we'll have a look at an example. Uh, so this example is a kind of very simplified version of something that I did at work recently. Um, it's adding type safety to moustache templates. So I hope you all know what moustache templates are. They have these curly brackets that represent placeholders in your templates and then you can, you can render the template by filling in the placeholders. So here we have hello first name, the weather is weather today. So you would take this template, you'd have some context which had, uh, which is like a a string to string map saying first name is Chris, weather is sunny. You combine those two and you can render a template. And we want to do this in a type safe way. So we want to make sure that we have filled in all of our placeholders. We haven't missed any out. You don't want to send an email to a customer saying, dear curly brackets first name, comma. So to avoid that, we're going to take the template and generate using a macro a case class which corresponds to all of the placeholders in that template. And that means that if you filled in, if you manage to instantiate, uh, create an instance of this case class and your code compiles, then it means you filled in the, the template correctly. So the plan is we load a moustache template at um, from the file system, we parse it to find all of the placeholders in the curly brackets, and we generate a, a case class that corresponds to that. And of course, we do this all at compile time. So once we've done that, in your, your code, you can use an instance of this case class and use it to render a template. So let's have a go. Okay, so again, we'll start with an example usage and then we'll implement it. Um, so we're doing things slightly differently this time. We're using a macro annotation. So we've got this annotation here called mustache. And it takes as an argument the, the path of the mustache template. I can show you the template. It's just the same one that was in the slides. So it's got these two placeholders, first name and weather. So we annotate an object using this annotation. We have this object here, name and weather, and we annotate it. So when the compiler compiles this code, it finds the annotation, it expands it by running a macro, and it will replace what's here with the result of the macro. So the macro will return a new tree, and it will replace this. So it's as if this code gets commented out, and it gets replaced with something here. And what we're going to generate in our macro is we're actually going to return the object we were given, so that will still be there. And we're also going to create a case class with the same name as the object, 
with the appropriate field names. So it'll be first name string, whether string. It'll look something like that. Of course, we're not actually going to change the source code. We're going to change the trees inside the compiler. But it will be as if you had written source like this. OK. Um, the build file, just quickly before we implement this, uh, we need to add the compiler plugin for Meta Paradise. And that's about it. Oh, and then we have a dependency on Scala Meta as well. So let's implement it. So again, we're using quasi quotes to do some pattern matching here. Uh, I'll just skip past all of this stuff. This is the interesting part. So here we are pattern matching on the thing that was annotated, which was an object. So this, this case will match. So we have an object, and we're extracting its name and a bunch of other stuff. Um, we load the moustache template from the file system, which I've already implemented. That's boring. We parse it to get a list of the placeholders or the, the variable names. That's already implemented. So what we're trying to create here, I'll just write it out again. We want to produce a case class, uh, which will have that name that we were given. And then it'll have some constructors. All of them will be strings, sorry, constructor parameters. That's the kind of thing we're trying to produce here. So let's start by building up this list of constructor parameters here. So we have the variable names. Uh, constructor params. We just have to turn them into an immutable list, because that's what Scala Meta wants. So then for each name, uh, we use a special different kind of quasi code here called param, which is just for constructing uh, parameters, like method parameters. And we build up a parameter by giving it a term name. And a type, which is just string. So now we have a list of constructor parameters. And we can use that to build up a tree. So now we're using normal quasi quotes again. Oops. And we want to return the object that we were given in the first place. We don't want to accidentally delete this object. That would be a bit naughty. So we'll return that first. <coughs> and then we'll return a case class with the same name. Uh, we have to turn it into a slightly different type, but it's the same name. And then we'll give it the constructor parameters that we just set up above. So that's it. And the only thing left to do is, at this point, while we were compiling our code and running this macro, we loaded the moustache template from the file system. So we may as well put that, save that somewhere so that we don't have to run it, compile it, or sorry, load it again at runtime. There's no point accessing the file system twice. So we will just stick it inside the companion object as a val like this. So we're returning the object almost unchanged. It's still got a body, which is all of the fields and members that it had before. But we're just adding one more at the top. So we return all of this using quasi quotes, and then our macro will return a tree. Yes? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. OK. Um, so given all of that, if we now run our example, it should 
print out a nicely rendered template. There we go. And again, this is all nice and type safe. So if we go to our example and we, we forgot to include one of these fields or we misnamed one of them, we'll change this one to Tenki, then it won't compile anymore. So now we have the nice, the convenience and simplicity of mustache templates and the type safety of Scala. Uh, so that was just a little taste of what uh, Scala Meta can do. But um, if you want to learn more about Scala Meta, I highly recommend this tutorial here. Um, it was made by Olaf Gearson. Uh, he presented it as a workshop at Scala World last year. Um, it's really good. Lots of exercises to go through. Okay, so now that we are all macro masters. I'm sure we all want to go away and write lots of macros. And hopefully I've convinced you that they are quite useful in some cases and they can be fun to write. But of course they come with an associated cost. I mean, you need to learn the API of Scala Meta or macros and you need to maintain them. You need to also convince other people on your team that they need to learn this stuff as well. Because you don't want to become the macro person on your team. You need to do this as a team. So uh, let's see where they lie on the spectrum of Scala developer happiness. Uh, let's say you want to implement some new feature and it potentially involves writing some boilerplate code which you're not too happy about. So you have a few options here. You could just write the code by hand, just not worry about it. Maybe if there's not that much boilerplate code that's a reasonable solution but it doesn't feel very nice. Uh, you could use runtime reflection, which I would say is actually worse. Uh, then it's not safe if you want to refactor your code or it might blow up at runtime. It's quite slow as well. There's performance penalties to pay at runtime. You could use source code generation in SBT or something like that. I have a soft spot for this, I guess. I don't really mind it. Some people think it's not a very elegant solution. You could write a macro, because now we all know how to write macros. Or even better than that, you could let Miles Sabin write the macros for you. <laughs> In other words, let's use Shapeless. So, so Shapeless um, can do a lot of things that macros can do. They can solve a, it can solve a lot of similar problems, um, potentially with less work and more simple code. So it's worth knowing how it works. If you're tempted to solve a problem using a macro, it's worth finding out whether you could work, do the same thing with Shapeless. So let's learn a little bit about it. Um, so it, it's quite a big and powerful library. It has a lot of features, but the very essence of Shapeless, the core, is this idea of generic programming. So if you have a case class person with a name and an age, for example, it's possible to convert between that and a more generic representation where you throw away the, the case class name and just keep the important information. So the fact that it's a string and it's an int in that order. Or if you're interested in the field names, then you might want to keep those as well. So um, Shapeless provides ways of doing this. One is called generic and one is called labeled generic. And a very common reason to use macros is that you often want the names of fields. For example, all of the names of the fields in a constructor of a case class, something like that. And you can write that with a macro, but it's a lot easier to do it by just calling labeled generic in Shapeless and it will give you that information as well. And the reason that it can do that is that Miles has written exactly the same macro already that you were about to write. So uh, just going to show you a couple of examples of use cases where you could maybe do, achieve something by writing a macro, but you could achieve something in a 
similar by using shapeless, and we'll just see it like how it looks in each case. So the first example is converting a case class into a map from string to any. Uh, this is something I had to do in the mustache, type check mustache example, for example. Um, we, we generated a case class using the macro, but then I needed to hand that to a Java library in order to render the template. And to do that, I had to turn it into a Java map. So it's something that you come across occasionally. So what we're trying to achieve here is uh, we have a case class foo with some fields. We have an instance of this case class. We call our method that we're going to implement case class to map, and it gives us back a map. So if we were to write this with macros, this is one way to write it. Um, I'm not gonna go into this code in great detail, but hopefully you can see that it's quite dense. There's quite a lot going on here. It just about fits on one slide, but there's a lot of code, and there's a lot of um, kind of Scala internals going on here. We've got type symbols and weak types and case class primary constructors and param lists and all kinds of stuff that we don't really care about. We just want to turn a case class into a map. Uh, so if we were to do the same thing with shapeless, uh, again, there's a few ways to do it, but here is one that works. Um, and hopefully, even if you've never used shapeless, this kind of makes sense. You can, you can see what we're trying to do here. Um, if you look at the implicit parameters to start with, we have gen a labeled generic, so we're getting the field names and value, uh, sorry, field names and types as a labeled generic, generic representation of the case class. Uh, we're somehow extracting the fields from that. We're turning those fields into a list, and then down here we are just turning that list into a map. So it's a lot closer to the problem domain, I think, than using a macro. It's more kind of what we are trying to achieve rather than how we do it. It's abstracting away all of the, the nasty macro-ness. Uh, so that's one example. And just one more example before we wrap up. Um, this is converting one case class into a similar case class. So we have an input class, which has a foo and a baz. We've got an output, which has a foo, a bar, and a baz. So we've got a, an extra field here that we need to populate somehow. And the way we, this is going to work is we, we have an instance of the input type here, which we provide as our first argument, and then as more arguments, we can provide key value pairs so that we can populate the extra fields that we're missing. And of course, we want this to be type safe. So if we miss a field that's, ne that's necessary, then it shouldn't compile. Or if we provide a field that isn't necessary, then it shouldn't compile. Um, this kind of thing is sometimes useful when you are converting between um, models in different layers. If you're using DDD, for example, you might have persistence layer models, which have uh, IDs and things in them, and then you might have uh, domain layer models, and you want to convert between them. That's a common use case. Um, so if you write this with a macro, it looks pretty horrible. Um, I don't think this is even the whole thing. It just wouldn't fit on the slide. And yeah, I have actually done this before I knew how to use shapeless, and it was pretty bad. And then if we do it with shapeless, I mean, it's, it's more code than it was before, but it's still reasonably neat, I think. And uh, I won't go into the details of this one because it's a little bit more complex, but hopefully it kind of makes a bit more sense than the macro version. Uh, so that's all I have time for on shapeless, but if you want to learn more about it, because there is so much to learn about shapeless, then I highly recommend this book, The Type Astronaut's Guide to Shapeless. Uh, it's available as a free download. It's a PDF. Uh, you can get it from GitHub at this address. Uh, also, Dave Gurnell, the author of this book, gave a good talk at London Scala User Group last year, where lots of live coding, and he goes through a lot of examples in the book and shows you how to use Shapeless. 
So I, re uh, I recommend the video of this talk. Okay, so that's it. In summary, uh, macros are fun and useful, whether you're using the old macro API or Scala Meta. Um, do the Scala Meta tutorial, it's really good. And read the Shapeless book. And all the code and the slides are online here. And I'll tweet the stuff later. Thank you. クリスさんありがとうございました、えー、質問がある方がいらっしゃいましたら挙手をお願いしますいつもの質問がある方がいらっしゃいましたら挙手をお願いしますいつもの質問がある That's fine. Um, but uh, did did Scala Meta introduce the um, the quasi quotes in the Scala console, or was that available using uh, the previous Macro Paradise and and friends? In the REPL, you mean? Yeah, you can um, actually use the AST directly in the REPL. Yes, you can use quasi quotes in the REPL with Scala Meta. I'd could you do it before though? I thought you could. Okay. Dennis will probably know. Yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. you could. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> 他に質問がある方いらっしゃいますか。質問内容なので、えー、これで、えー、終わりにしたいと思います。クリスさんありがとうございました。<笑>